sometimes at our military treatment facilities, we act more like community hospitals. We see cold sniffles and occasionally a severe illness. So we don't see the sort of injuries that a level one trauma center would see that would replicate what we'd see downrange. The first time you're exposed to a disaster scenario, we don't know what you may do. Some people may panic, some people may do the wrong thing. In the old days, we'd watch, we'd see, and then we'd do, and then you're on your own. And that is not the best way to ensure that we're doing the best for our patients. This is at 80% right now. So before someone's placed in a scenario where they'd have to take care of a patient with these life-altering injuries, let's implant folks who have a medical background, but not necessarily the trauma training background that we need, and get them spun up on those scenarios. Simulation offers the opportunity to get hands-on training and tactical training where you're actually applying the knowledge that you know in an environment that's very similar to what you would encounter in the hospital. Everybody knows um, CPR training where you know, um, a mannequin, maybe an Annie or a Chris or something like that, and you know, you're doing chest compressions and, and breathing into this, this relatively low fidelity, not very lifelike mannequin. It's human nature for, for us to come in and you see something that's plastic or rubber and you automatically assume it's not real. And then you see them breathe. And then you feel the pulses. And then you see them blink. And then you see them bleed. And then now you're saying, whoa. The highest fidelity mannequins have animatronics, um, physiologic engines, meaning if I give this mannequin a medication, it will respond as though I've given it the right medication. It can actually detect what I've given it. I can put a blood pressure cuff on this mannequin and it gives me a pressure, high or low, in a physiologic range. The pulse, I can feel it in real time. I can have them sweat, I can have them turn blue. We have a simulator that bleeds profusely from multiple sites and it also moves so the legs will move up and down and it also has audio so we can speak through the simulator and do things like groaning or screaming or calling out for help and for some of our first-time students when they see that in a training environment they really get excited about it or they freak out one or the other. There are a variety of levels of training from the very simple, I need to put a tourniquet on this bleeding wound and just learn how to tighten it down, to I need to be able to perform a lateral canthotomy. If someone has a crush injury to their eye, I need to find a way to relieve pressure to save their sight. So that's a very wide range of skills that we're trying to teach. Simulation training has been demonstrated um, with scientific rigor to reduce hospital-based errors, which in turn saves lives. We're a program that takes care of medical modeling and simulation for the Air Force. We have 52 contracts, and lo those are located at 30 different locations, and we also support 90 medical treatment facility programs. And so with that, we have 170 courses for the Air Force, and some we share with the Army, which we have Army students and Navy students as well. For medical simulation, you have AFMAS, MMAS, the Army CSC, uh, you have the DEMSO office. Uh, with the DHA, but simulation, you know, started with aviation, so the aviation world is, is huge in simulation. I think that the collaboration that the um, Air Force and the Navy have had in the half-mast and the end-mast goes a long way and is maybe even a model for reducing that duplication in, in the ways that it can. But in addition to providing programmatic support, we also help with curriculum development. We have two curriculum development specialists on our staff. In addition, we've got a computer program that we developed to help people select their right equipment. In medical modeling and simulation management that we do at NMAST and say at the Air Force Medical Modeling and Simulation Training Program are not designed to just incorporate the newest, latest, greatest, expensive technology. It's actually to teach better, to teach faster, to teach in a more durable way. It's very hard for us to, to mimic a combat environment outside. It's an, a real production. You'll have to have smoke, you have to, to mimic the bad guys, and all these other extra things that you need to put in there to make them feel like they're in a combat situation. WAVE stands for Wide Area Virtual Environments, and it's essentially a panel of TV screens that give you a more immersive environment. 
It's difficult sometimes to uh, replicate what it's like being shot at and in a war zone and things are on fire and things are falling apart, but it's easy to project it onto a screen. You send out insurgents, you send out grenades, you throw RPGs, it's very easy. You can't, it's very hard to mimic that in real time. And so these screens combined with pyrotechnics and lighting give you a more realistic example of what it's like to be in a combat zone without having to burn something down. It allows us to desensitize them a little bit. It's still going to be terrifying, it's still going to be intense, but at least they can say in their mind, I've done this before, I've seen this, but I know I need to focus not on this outward stuff, but on our patients and on our mission. The more realistic you can make your training, the better the learning is going to be, the more they remember out of it. There's technology that's being tested right now in the mixed reality realm where they could don some a headset, a very lightweight headset, uh, and that feed goes back to a physician back in the States or wherever the closest, uh, you know, fob is. And they can walk them through, this is how you put in a chest tube. This is how you open their abdomen with an overlay of what the anatomy is and a surgeon back at home saying, cut on the dotted line, put your finger here, take this needle and thread here and sew there. So if I can give you training through virtual reality or through serious medical gaming, that means that you don't have to be in a facility that has a classroom. You don't have to be somewhere with a trained simulation operator. You can pull out your phone or you can get on your computer and you can have access to this training anywhere in the world at any time. We're finding that many of these newer technologies keep them engaged um, for longer um, and actually um, have the promise of helping them retain information for longer. The distractions can happen in the real world. The things that happen in front of a patient care team can distract you from doing the right things and losing your focus. But if you practice over and over in front of a mannequin with scenarios that are real world, based on real world things that have happened, we can come to the point of protecting the patient and doing a better job. So absolutely focusing, sharpening up on your skills. Medical simulation is the way of the future and it's incumbent upon us to make sure that we keep up with that technology to give the best quality training for our students. Regardless of where you get trained um, and who the instructor is on the day you happen to be there, that you get the same training so that when you go um, you know, to some overseas location and need to make a difference in somebody's life on the first day that you've hit the ground, that you've received training that can save lives.